name is Matt Kramer. I'm president of the, the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. This is our Breakfast with the Mayors with Mayor Chris Coleman and Mayor Betsy Hodges of Minneapolis. I want to recognize some other elected officials who have joined us this morning. And we, if we missed anybody, please, uh, after I introduce you, stand up. But I'm just going to recognize some folks. If you want to stand up, raise your hands, then we'll give them a round of applause. Ramsey County Commissioner Jim McDonough, St. Paul City Council Member Rebecca Necker, Naker, Minneapolis City Council Member John Quincy, and Minneapolis City Council Member Jacob Fry. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. We also have a number of our board members from both chambers here, and this is another one of those great examples of as much as we're competitive, we recognize the Twin Cities is stronger when chambers work together on business advocacy, and so a great thanks to our various board members who've joined us today. Instead of introducing everybody, if members of the Minneapolis Regional and the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce board members would like to stand and we can recognize them, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As with all membership events, it's really important that we never forget in the chamber world that we work for you. And so events like this are an opportunity to not only hear from great speakers, but to recognize the members who make this event possible. I'd like to recognize our sponsors, and if we could hold our applause, and we'll give everybody a round of applause at the end. Our presenting sponsors today include Comcast, Golf Public, the University of St. Thomas, Excel Energy, our contributing sponsors, AT&T, District Energy, Grand Casino Mille Lacs Hinkley, Larson King, Minnesota Public Radio, PCL Construction, Platinum Bank, and Sunrise Banks. Please help, th help me in joining the, in thanking these sponsors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to introduce now our, the chair of the board of the St. Paul Area Chamber, John Regal. John is Director of Risk Management and Local Public Affairs for Securian, a large company you've obviously heard of in downtown St. Paul. Currently, John is chair of our board and is past chair of our Chamber's Political Action Committee. He's also been both past chairman and current board member of the St. Paul Port Authority. Please join me in welcoming John. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all. Uh, first of all, thanks to Town & Country for hosting uh, this event. Town & Country is one of my favorite places. I believe it's the oldest golf course in Minnesota. It might be one of the oldest in the country, I think top five. And they are great hosts for also uh, many St. Paul Winter Carnival events, uh, which starts this week. I invite all of you to attend. My job is to introduce uh, our mayor. Uh, Chris Coleman took office in St. Paul in 2005 after several years as a city council member, community, and neighborhood leader. His priorities include working to close the achievement gap, creating sustainable and responsible budgets, and investing in the infrastructure of St. Paul. Mayor Coleman has achieved several of his goals, advocating for ed education and public safety, and being instrumental in championing the Green Line LRT, the largest infrastructure project ever undertaken in Minnesota, at least for another year here or so. Uh, Coleman was re-elected re overwhelmingly, and when he completes his third term, he will be the second longest mayor serving in the history of St. Paul. Under Mayor Coleman, St. Paul's downtown has seen a revitalization. With the Green Line and CHS Field, more restaurants and entertainment venues have moved in demand for housing increased exponentially, and downtown's vibrant culture has grown. And, I, and for someone who works at Securian, we will vouch for that. On, on behalf of our 2,600 employees downtown, it is fantastic. Bridging the, excuse me, bridging the education gap for children is at the core of Mayor Coleman's agenda. He understands that the future and current success of St. Paul depends on our ability to equip our students with the tools for success from cradle to career. Under Mayor Coleman's leadership, St. Paul has become a national leader in green initiatives and sustainable living. Mayor Coleman's top priority has always remained the safety of all residents and visitors to St. Paul. Committed to building world-class departments that set the standard for service to residents and community Mayor Coleman continues to invest in emergency personnel and training, as well as improve technology to assist them in keeping our community safe. He also has a life outside of City Hall. He's an avid guitar player. He also likes to lace them up, 
play hockey with family and friends afterwards. How many times have you skated down the crash dice? Uh, I, think it's four. Uh, I think it's four. And he's still with us. And he is the biggest Bruce Springsteen fan that I know. Have you seen the set list from the Chicago show last week? February 29th in St. Paul is going to be crazy. I invite you all to join us. Please join me in welcoming his honor, Chris Coleman. Well, let me pick up on that last point. The answer is no. I do not have any Bruce Springsteen tickets. Stop asking me. I am, I am not ticket master. I, I can't. <laughs> It, 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 is, it has been like, uh, I, I was thinking of just changing my cell phone number because uh, I'm like, literally, they have this thing, you go online, you buy tickets, you, you get your credit card. Uh, that's normally how people get tickets to Bruce, except for me, when you're the mayor, you just call up and you say, Jack Larson, can you get me some tickets to Bruce? Uh, but we are excited about all of that and crashed ice coming. Uh, they should be starting to build the course in a, in a couple of uh, weeks or maybe even, they got to be soon because it's the end of February this year. Uh, I am, uh, now that I'm a little bit older, a little bit, hopefully a little bit wiser, I'm actually starting to contemplate whether I'm stupid enough to go down that course again this year. The only reason I'm tempted to do it this year is because I haven't gotten my brother Emmett out on the, on the uh, course yet. Uh, and the, real, the reason originally was because I needed to borrow his shoulder pads in order to be able to go down. Uh, but, uh, but now that I have my own shoulder pads, he, there's no excuse for him not to go down. And I want some other Coleman to look more embarrassed than I do when I go down that course. Uh, I want to do a couple thank yous. First of all, to, uh, to Todd Klingo uh, for his incredible service to this community, to the business community, to all of Minneapolis and St. Paul, this region. Uh, just, uh, Todd, you're one of the great, great ones, and uh, we're so sorry to see you retiring. Uh, but we know that your legacy for what you have done for this community will stand long and strong. And so thank you so much. There, there's another individual in the room that's retiring soon that, uh, that deserves another a, a big dose of applause and, and credit and, and uh, uh, he's more self-effacing than, than Todd is, and so I know he would have a witty retort if I, if I was to allow him to get up here and say anything. Uh, but Louis Jamboy from the Port Authority has been an un unbelievable partner for the city of St. Paul in so many different things, from uh, uh, Gerdo Steel staying open to uh, the, the, the soccer stadium uh, coming, uh, hopefully breaking ground this, uh, this summer, uh, and all the things that he has done over the years. Louis is retiring, although we're not going to let him go away too far. Uh, but we want to give Louis a round of applause for his efforts. And the person I'm most surprised to see in this room today is Dave Brooks, because I was convinced after the Wild game last night, Dave would have dropped over dead uh, watching that game. It was one of the, one of the most disappointing things I've, I've seen. So we're kind of in that weird period in, in, uh, that happens seem, seemingly every year. The Vikings have been kicked out of the, out of the playoffs. The Wild are in a slump. Uh, the baseball hasn't started. Uh, we, you know, we're kind of waiting for the Winter Carnival to get kicked off. It's just kind of this, we're kind of in this stasis, this holding pattern, where, where it doesn't seem like much of anything is happening. But just like we know spring will come, uh, we know that the Wild will go back on a winning streak. They'll get in the playoffs and then get knocked out by Chicago in the second round. Uh, uh, one of these years, we're going to get past that second round. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that the work that we're doing, uh, in, in the winter, the work that we've been doing over the many years is really what's setting the tone in the future for the strength of this community, setting the tone for, for not only businesses to thrive, uh, but for millennials to come into our communities, for, for new workers to come, uh, for all the community to be successful. We really are. This is, this is amazing. Uh, when I think about, particularly as it relates to downtown St. Paul, and in all of St. Paul, the east side and, and, and across the city, when you think about the challenges that we were facing 10 years ago when I took office, when you think about uh, the, the state of downtown, uh, it, is, it has come a long ways, baby, uh, to get where we've gotten today. Uh, for those of you that remember when they had cigarette advertising on TV, uh, you might recall that phrase. But the fact of the matter is, uh, it was because we've done a, hard work, a lot of hard work, and we've done it together. We have worked very closely, hand in hand, 
uh, business community, uh, the philanthropic community, the government sector. Ramsey County has been an incredible partner for us on, on so many things, not the least of which, of course, was light rail. Uh, getting that line built and the, and the persistent vision of our commissioners, including Jim. Uh, I don't know if other commissioners are here today, but I, I just want to thank all of you for making what is happening today. I'm going to try to be short uh, because I, the favorite part of this breakfast for me is the question and answer session, and I want to get to that. Uh, but I just want to say that, that that our work is not done. And I know that I've talked about this in the past uh, at this breakfast and, uh, and any opportunity that I can. It's been in the art articles in the paper. It has been in just about every aspect of what we're doing. The fact of the matter is we are not where we need to go as a community because not everyone is going with us at the same pace and the same rate. If we don't start doing things in a way that are equitable and fair, that create an open opportunity for everyone in this community to be successful, then we are not going to continue to have the strength of this community that we need to, to have to sustain our Fortune 500 companies, to sustain, to sustain the quality of life that we have. And it's an all-hands-on-deck approach. This isn't just something that, uh, you know, that the you know, St. Paul uh, Foundation is supposed to be working on. It's not just something that the City Council works on, or it's not just something that any one of us works on. But equity in this community is something that every one of us has to participate in, in one way, shape, or form. And there are a lot of different things that you can do to be a part of that. If you're a business and you can provide a, an opportunity for a right track intern this summer, that is a fundamental step forward for a young person uh, to get into the workforce, to understand what it is to, to have a job, uh, what it takes to be successful in a, in a work environment. Those things matter. If you're, in the edu you know, if you're an educator or if you're a person that wants to participate in tutoring or mentoring a young person, all of those things matter. But ultimately, it's lifting all of our voices up to say that we can't continue to be a society where there are the haves and have-nots like we have in the Twin Cities in the state of Minnesota right now. It is plain and simply embarrassing. When I look at the statistics that say that we have the largest disparity between uh, educational outcomes of any place in the country, that is not who we are. That is not who we aspire to be, and that is not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. And it certainly isn't from a moral perspective, but I tell you for sure it's not from an economic perspective. We have a huge threat on the horizon in terms of our businesses, and that's attract attracting and retaining talent uh, to fulfill the jobs that we have, not only existing in the region, but that we hope to grow in this region. And if we're not making sure that the talent that we have in our high schools and our grade schools, in the city of St. Paul and the city of Minneapolis, are, are trained and prepared to take their place in 21st century workforce with the technological skills that they need to be successful, then those companies are going to struggle, they're going to wither, and they may well move somewhere else where they can attract that talent. This is absolutely critical, and we, are, we, we cannot delay on this front anymore. Now, I wish I had simple answers because there isn't one, and we've tried, and it is not for lack of, 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 of effort. I think that's one of the most frustrating things for all of us that sit around the tables and have these conversations. It's not because we haven't put resources into it. It isn't because we haven't tried. We have Generation Next that former Mayor Ryback is leading to really kind of look at a, a broad scale of educational things. We have the Northside Achievement Zone in Minneapolis. We have the Promise Neighborhood in St. Paul. We have Sprockets, our out-of-school time program. We have racial equity training where every department in the city of St. Paul has to have a racial equity plan, not only with respect to hiring uh, their, their new employees, employees, but with respect to the delivery of public services in the city of St. Paul. Uh, you know, we are doing so many things well, but at the end of the day, we're not moving that ball forward. And so, uh, you know, it's going to take some creative thinking. It's going to take some disruptive thinking. Uh, we're going to have to start thinking about doing things differently than we have historically done. We have to look inward to recognize what, what our own role has been in, in, in terms of uh, preventing people from achieving in the way that they have. It, I, I tell you, it's not easy work. If you look at the work that, uh, that Valeria Silva has done in, this, in the school district in the city of St. Paul, uh, it, has, it has been difficult, it has been challenging, uh, it certainly has been disruptive, and, and for those of us that have had kids in the St. Paul public school system uh, or have them in the system now, we know that that's, th those are hard issues and those are real struggles. And when they're your children, you don't, you don't want to sit there and say, well, it's okay for my children not to get the resources that they need. But the fact of the matter is we do have to do things differently, and we have to support those that are willing to be disruptive in the way that we look at things if we're going to change the outcome. We've got to stop coming to these meetings on a regular basis or, or in other settings and say, well, we're working on this, or we're working on this. We need to move the ball. So that is my imperative to all of you today, that to, to recognize the crisis that we're in. And it, and it exhibits itself in a lot of different ways. Obviously, you know, every city in, in, in this entire country 
uh, is, is, uh, is one incident away uh, from major disruption. We've seen it in cities across, the, across this country. We've seen it in our own backyards. Uh, we've certainly seen it. We know we have, we've had uh, you know, protests on, on, on the Lake Street Bridge. We've had marches down University Avenue. We've had occupations of, you know, of the precinct over in Minneapolis. We've had all these things. Uh, I think we do those well. I think we have great relationships in our community with the communities of color. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if we're not serving those communities, then we're not doing our job as leaders, as business owners, as members of this community that understand where we need to go. So that is my challenge today. That is my imperative to you. Uh, I'll leave it at that, uh, and, and we'll get back into some question and answers at the, at the end of this. Uh, but I just want to thank you all, because I know that in this room, in this community, we have the power to make the change that we need to make uh, to make sure that every child is successful in the city of St. Paul, every family is thriving, and every business has the workers that they need to be successful well into the future. So thank you for being here. I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mayor Coleman, for your commitment and service to St. Paul, and also for being such a strong voice for the region. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura McCartan. I'm a regional vice president with Xcel Energy, and I also chair the board of directors for the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, I just want to say something. I'm picking up on uh, what was mentioned earlier for uh, Ted, uh, Todd Klingel. Todd, our president, announced that he plans to retire at the end of March, and um, we're sad to see him go, but we're uh, glad to see him you know, go off and do what he needs to do. And I think at this point, uh, it's um, appropriate to mention that Todd was the person who actually initiated this event 11 years ago, bringing the mayors of both of our cities together. So I want to thank him for that and also for his unwavering regional perspective. Todd, thank you. Well, Excel Energy is so proud to be a sponsor of this event again, and uh, we are also very privileged to serve these vibrant Twin Cities communities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. These are cities that are thriving and growing under the visionary leadership of two fantastic mayors. We're proud to be partners with uh, all of you in the room here to help both of these cities achieve their goals, and I'd like to just speak a little bit about one of these that uh, Mayor Hodges has been a champion of and has really, I think, staked out a special position in the, in the country, perhaps even in the world, and that is last year the city, XL Energy, and Centerpoint Energy created the first-of-its-kind clean energy partnership. By working together in new ways, this partnership will drive actions and innovation that will help the city achieve its climate action plan and its 2040 energy vision. This effort is receiving recognition both nationally and internationally. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, the White House and the Department of Energy recognized the city of Minneapolis as one of 16 communities chosen to be climate action champions, in part because of the Clean Energy Partnership. Also last year, Mayor Hodges was one of nine mayors in the world was invited to attend the Vatican Climate Change um, Conference. So I think that's a real testament to what uh, Minneapolis is doing, and we're very happy to be part of that with you, Mayor Hodges. Her vision for the city brings abundant opportunities for businesses and residents alike, working for continued growth, equity, and simply a well-run city. Please help me welcome Mayor Hodges. Well, good morning, everybody. It's early, um, but since Todd's retiring, I'll forgive him for that. Um, and would like to start first by saying, um, Todd, I appreciate so much, <clears throat> excuse me, the work that you have done uh, in the community. You have been a staunch advocate for business, um, both in good times and in bad, that you have um, been tireless. I know that when I was a council member and now as mayor, um, that you have kept your eyes on the prize of our growth and our prosperity and support for business in Minneapolis and in the region, um, and that, that that has left a mark. Um, you know, you, uh, are, are, uh, you have decided to uh, move on in the classiest way possible, giving as much support possible um, for the worst reason possible, um, but um, in the best way possible. So thank you so much. Um, uh, I 
I probably left people confused when I said for the worst reason possible. Uh, he was clear in his uh, thing that it was regarding some health challenges that, that he's had. And so I'm sorry that you're struggling with those, but glad you'll have the time and energy to handle them um, as you need. Um, and so thank you. I also want to thank Matt, and I want to thank John, um, and I want to thank Laura. Um, for your leadership, for pulling us together, for having this great room full of people here today. And I want to thank um, my partner in governance, uh, Chris Coleman. Um, I will say this, A, I have my Springsteen tickets. <laughs> B, not only have I seen the set list from the Chicago show, I've listened to the Chicago show on E Street Radio. Uh, so I think I might vie for the second biggest Springsteen fan <laughs> that you know. Um, we are at halftime, uh, uh, Mayor Coleman and I, of this term. Uh, and it's been a good time for reflection. It's been a good time for celebration. It's been a good time for course correction. And it's been a good time for gathering input, uh, which is a lot of what I have been doing um, these last weeks and months. Um, we have had a lot of successes um, in the areas that we would like to have success. Uh, the vision that I put out for the city, the vision that Minneapolis supported, uh, and that we are working, moving forward on every day is one of growth, of prosperity, and of equity. All on a foundation of running a city well and making sure that we are getting the basics done every day. Equity is the best growth strategy that we have. But the reason that we want a growth strategy is so that we can continue to prosper as a community so that people's lives can be great, so the investments you make uh, can pay off well for the businesses, the companies, the corporations that you're part of, uh, for, the comp for the community as a whole, for the employees who work for you, and that helps generate success for our entire region. Uh, if anybody's been left confused by that and whether or not I understand that in the last few weeks, please know that I understand that the investments that you make in this community are in large measure uh, a testament to the success of our community, but also the source of the success of our community. The number one source of our success is our people. And when you invest in our community, you are investing in our people. And when you invest, and when we invest in our people, all of us together, we grow and we prosper as a community. So Laura mentioned the Clean Energy Partnership Agreement. That has been a fantastic partnership that's helping us meet some clean energy, uh, some, some renewable energy goals that we have moving forward together as a community and as a planet. Um, one of the biggest growth strategies we have is making sure, as Mayor Coleman said, that we have the workforce that we need for the future. I have been investing in workforce and workforce development uh, because you guys need people to work for you, and there are some sectors in which you have negative employment, particularly in some of the technology and IT fields. So we are partners in Minneapolis with the White House in something called Tech Hire, which is great and something you might all want to know about, because on the front end, uh, you know, you don't need to know how to code. You don't need to have a four-year degree to code. You just need to know how to code. And so if we come up with accelerated tech training programs that people can go through, it doesn't require a four-year degree, at the end of that, you have people trained for the jobs that you want. So the Tech Hire Partnership is we help support these accelerated tech training programs. Uh, we have partnerships with businesses and companies who then agree to take the folks that we hire through those accelerated partnerships, uh, through those accelerated training programs. And then on the front end, we invest in making sure that women and people of color can take advantage of those opportunities and have what they need. So in the city's budget, I have invested dollars for those scholarships, but really it's the partnership with the private sector and it's the partnership with these accelerated programs that is really driving this. We have already placed 180 people in jobs averaging $50,000 salaries a year. We are doing our first all-women cohort of these training programs, and it's infinitely scalable. So anybody interested in having a new way of meeting your workplace needs, which I know folks have, particularly in tech, please come talk to me or Eric Garcia Luna in my office, who is right here up front. But that's one of the partnerships that is making our community so vibrant, that public-private pri partnership that is meeting the needs for our growth and prosperity while still understanding that equity is the best growth strategy that we have, knowing where the demographics are going in the region. But as I sit here, and it's halftime, 
understanding that communication and relationship building is one of the things that I get to do even more of in the second half. And to that end, I've been having one-on-one -on -one conversations with many of you, uh, with, the, with the largest employers in town, with medium, small employers in town, making sure I'm hearing from you what your needs are and what your business needs are. I have a CEO roundtable that I've put together to give me help in thinking and advice moving forward so we can think together about how to make this, uh, how to continue the prosperity that we are experiencing currently in the region and how to make sure that everybody contribute, can contribute to that growth and that prosperity. Uh, one of the other great things that's moving forward in the city of Minneapolis is Cradle to K and the Talking is Teaching. Uh, a program that we are that I launched in the fall and that's going to be uh, really rolling out fully this year. 80% of brain development happens by age three. It's the first opportunity gap a kid faces because between low-income kids and higher-income kids, there's a 30 million word gap in the number of words they hear by age three. And the best way to develop the brain is to, is to talk, read, and sing to those kids. We can actively make our kids smarter just by talking to them. And for many of you in this room, talking is not a problem. <laughs> So talk to all the kids you see, age zero to three. You'll be making your community smarter, and it's a super easy way to do it. Uh, we have a partnership with the Clinton Foundation, and they're too small to fail. Talking is teaching initiative that we're going to be doing a media campaign uh, and, and have a full opportunity for the community to participate. So stay tuned for that, because if we can get our kids' brains, if we can get them the healthiest possible start, which is what my Cradle to K agenda is designed to do, if we can get them the healthiest possible start by age three, those results will persist uh, data shows from our own Aaron Sojourner at the U of M that uh, those results persist into grade school, anecdotally into high school and beyond whatever else happens in that child's life beyond there. It is one of the first and best investments we can make in our kids. And there's a lot of exciting growth that's coming in 2016 for the city of Minneapolis. We have Nicollet Mall, we have our downtown East Commons Park, the stadium is gonna be opening up, the Wells Fargo buildings are, are, are on the way. Um, we have, uh, in the Super Bowl is coming, the NCAA Final Four is coming, uh, and then we have all kinds of development all around the city that's happening. There was a point uh, in the early uh, 2000s, late 90s, when uh, the majority of cranes in the world were in Shanghai. And now I think the majority of cranes in the world are in Minneapolis. <laughs> and that's a point of pride. We have a lot of growth going on and that's in part because of um, care and attention to knowing that this is a key part of our success in the next years. And that people are moving into cities in unprecedented numbers for the first time in human history. More people live in cities than don't. And that is changing how we do business. That's changing how we think about growth and development in exciting ways, which is why the transit partnerships that we've had here in the region with St. Paul, with the business community, have been so important and so successful. It also drives people wanting to live here without a car. Increasingly, people want to live without a car or with one car rather than two for the family. So the transit and transportation investments also attract people into the city, which is what we want for the growth and prosperity that we have. So there's been a lot going on. There will be a lot of questions that I'm happy to answer about any uh, anything that's going on that, that Mayor Coleman and I can both answer. But I will say I have a feeling one of the burning questions on the table uh, will be about the working families agenda and the workforce um, uh, the workforce uh, work group that we have uh, looking at earn sick and save time. And what I will say is this: for the scheduling proposals that were on the table, uh, it was hard, uh, and we did not find a way to solve a problem that would not create more problems than it solved. And when that became crystal clear, and many of you used your voices to point that out, uh, I want to be clear that I listened and I heard you and it's off the table. Um, there are a lot of people mad at me about that, but it was the right thing to do given the situation and the problem we were trying to solve. There's still a problem. There's still a problem. Uh, but uh, we have yet to find the solution for that problem. Earn sick and save time. We learned a lot. I learned a lot 
from, from uh, working on the scheduling issue. We have a, a group that's been put together. I have three appointees on it, uh, one from large business, one from small business, uh, one from sort of the labor advocacy community because I want to make sure we had that depth and breadth of perspective. We have, they've, been, they've been going to a lot of listening sessions around the community. There have been 10 already. There's four or five more to go. I've, we have asked a lot of them. But they are getting feedback from all corners. Um, about this issue of earned sick and safe time. Uh, because with this one, uh, clearly people want a level playing field. But it's also a public health issue. That uh, if, if we make people choose between getting well and getting paid, people are going to choose getting paid more often than getting well because their livelihoods depend on it. And we don't need an incentive in the system for people to come to work sick. We don't need a disincentive for people calling in sick. And that's the question on the table that we're getting a lot of feedback on. A lot of folks in this room have been able to give feedback on it, and I thank you for that. They are going to be bringing recommendations back by the end of February, um, and uh, we will continue to work together and move forward from there um, to find the best solution possible uh, for an employee and a workforce issue and also a public health issue. So I appreciate people's patience and people's partnership on that. Uh, I think, w I hope one of the lessons you take away is that we listen and that we listened and that we want to work with you and that I want to work with you moving forward on all of these issues. So that said, I am eager to take questions, um, eager to talk about whatever folks want to talk about. And uh, thank you very much for the partnership uh, these first two years of my mayorship. Thank you very much for the partnership you've shown, um, for the hands that have been reached out, um, and for the hands that have come back when I've reached out my own. And I look forward to more together as we have an incredibly successful 2016, 2017, and beyond. Well, the first thing I'll say is, when you want to stay on your agenda, don't hand the microphone to someone who's retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just have a couple of quick comments, one for each of the mayors. Um, Alan Rickman's passing must have been especially difficult yeah, for you actually. with the biggest diehard fan in the world, and <laughs> I'm sorry for your loss. You. And then when the inner city trip went to Toronto, we were gathering one evening, we looked around, we said, where's Mayor Coleman? And they said, didn't you know Bruce Springsteen is, is in town? <laughs> so he was at the Springsteen concert in Toronto. <laughs> On a serious note, just two hey. weeks ago, these two mayors and Matt and myself were in front of the Capitol talking about this work, future workforce agenda. And we're on the same page. And it was so heartening to know that this region sees this as the number one issue. It's actually, that is what keeps me up at night. Nothing else is this workforce plan and equity. And these two are leading the charge. And they fully understand it as multi-strategies. But when we mentioned Right Start, of course, there's step up. So if you're in Minneapolis and you can't participate in Right Start, you certainly can participate in Step Up, and you can talk to us more about that. So now, we'll get to your questions. For the two mayors, don't everybody jump up at once, but I'm ready. And I'm skinny so that I can get through. <laughs> <coughs> Question for Mayor Hodges. Mayor Hodges, there was a piece in the Minneapolis paper a week or so ago about, I think around 5,000 units of moderate income housing going out of that status because the owners of the buildings can make more money if they're converting them to high-end condos and things like that. I'd be interested in your observations on the city's role there and what might be done to improve that for the future. Well, the issue of affordable housing uh, is a huge one as you grow. Um, because as we become more popular, people want to come in. And how do we maintain the mixed income uh, housing that we have? And how do we actually create more mixed income neighborhoods than we have now? Most people are happier in a mixed income neighborhood. Um, than they are in uh, concentrations of wealth or concentrations of poverty or, or, you know, not having that diversity. Most, you know, that's what the studies show. We are looking as a city, um, and I should note uh, that Councilmember Fry, Councilmember Quincy, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for your partnership. Both of them have been leaders on affordable housing issues. Councilmember Bender, uh, who is chair of the zoning committee, is looking at um, helping us look at some of our zoning policies so that is easier to build and create affordable housing throughout the entire city. Um, the success of the city's uh, our, our ability to allow accessory dwelling units, which is a way of saying you can make your garage or your carriage house or what have you um, into living spaces, whether they're connected to the home or not. 
creates other options for affordability. But our zoning uh, is going to help us have some tools in place to, uh, you know, if we if we can successfully move that forward, have some tools in place to address the affordable housing issues you're referencing. Can I just add, <clears throat> you know, this is a this is a challenge for every city in the country if they're growing if they're going forward. Uh, there are a lot of communities where the workers in the communities have can't live within a 60 miles of, of where they're working. So you got to work really aggressively with all of your partners. We have Paul Williams with PPL uh, doing incredible housing up on University Avenue. You've got. Uh, Tim Marks is here with Catholic Charities working on really kind of creating that pipeline up from the streets to uh, to having permanent, uh, stable, affordable housing. Uh, but it takes resources to do that. So whether that's using tax increment financing and the projects that you have to have a certain number of the units affordable, uh, I think that's one of the really appropriate uses of tax increment financing right now uh, is to be able to deal with some of the, those affordable issues. But we've got to figure out a way to make sure that the workforce that's working in the city of St. Paul can also live in the city of St. Paul and raise their families here. Question from Eric Coleman. I'm curious as to what St. Paul's conversation around the earned sick leave might look like. Well, I hate to. Uh, we, we're going to. Uh, I don't. I don't want to blow the headline on Thursday. We're going to have a, a kind of a release. Um, first of all, City of St. Paul is going to lead by example. Uh, we are going to make sure that every city employee, whether they are a permanent employee or whether they are a temporary or seasonal worker, has some ability to accrue earned uh, sick and safe leave because uh, for all the reasons Mayor Hodges mentioned, it is important. We hope that by leading by example, we can work with our other business community partners to also uh, kind of take this on. But we're most importantly, and we're going to work, we, I, we've reached out to Matt uh, and, and others to say we want to have that community conversation with business owners at the table so that we can understand uh, the benefits, the opportunities, the challenges uh, to earn sick and safe leave uh, and to provide that for all employees in the city of St. Paul, whether they work for the city of St. Paul or whether they work for a private employer. But we do need to understand the concerns of the private employers and figure out a policy uh, that works. So the panel will be put together. We're going to make uh, recommendations, hopefully coming back to the council by the by the, by the 1st of June, uh, and then have that, that uh, move to the next level of discussion. Uh, this is for Mayor Coleman. Um, I'm Nancy Zinter. I'm the board chair for the Germanic American Institute over on Summit. And um, I just want to uh, um, thank, I guess, the city of St. Paul for all the support uh, for the Schmidt Brewery. Uh, most recently, uh, the St. Paul Housing and Deve Redevelopment Authority has uh, granted another loan, I believe. Um, I just think uh, for both cities, you know, all of our cultural gems like the Germanic American Institute, Schmidt Brewery, are really part of what makes this a really vibrant community. And I just want to make sure people keep doing that sort of thing. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and you know that beard takes a special place in my heart. <coughs> um, so. Uh, you know, anything that we can do to preserve the beer brewing past of the city of St. Paul. But if you haven't seen the Schmidt Brewery uh, and, and the old Hams Brewery over on the east side and seen what's going on over there, uh, you know, Schmidt has the artist loft housing, which is some of the, I, I literally, you know, it's, it's, it's going back to the low income uh, housing question. Uh, it's affordable housing for artists. So I was going to quit my job and pretend I was an actual guitar player just so I can move into the Schmidt lofts. It's really, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, it's wonderful housing. It took a building that was really, really, really difficult to try to figure out how to repurpose. Uh, Dominium was the partner. They've been a great partner on so many of these fronts. Um, and then it's got uh, the uh, the Urban Organics is, is, is adding a facility there, uh, much like their facility on the east side at the Hams Brewery, but much bigger uh, to, to have, uh, you know, they're going to start putting the fish tanks in and they're going to have the grow rooms, et cetera, et cetera. So repurposing these old industrial sites in a way that has that kind of mix of use is challenging, it's difficult, it is expensive, but is absolutely necessary if you're not going to have these pockets of disparity uh, and, and emptiness in your city. Uh, you know, I hate, I hate to pick on my, you know, cities from around the country, but if you've ever been to Memphis um, and, and you've gone to Sun Records, uh, which is, you know, if you're a music guy, that is the, the you know, that is the, uh, the wailing wall of music. And, 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 but, but when you're at Sun Records, there's, you know, and you look and you see the downtown skyline in the distance, uh, you walk for two miles where there is absolutely nothing but empty buildings. And it's not scary because there's nobody there at all. 
uh, and, and it is really sad. And that's why the Port Authority uh, and agencies like that become so critically important because once you get to a tipping point where those empty buildings have sat for so long and have not been restored, it is really difficult to kind of get the investment uh, going there. Uh, now, having said that, once you put a, uh, a, a microbrewery in, everything changes and we're all fine. So <laughs> our roots come back to where we began, beer. Good morning, my name is Will Roach, and i um, just curious, as you talked a little bit earlier about reflection in this two years, um, what synergies uh, are you finding within the greater Twin Cities, and where I may be going is more around workforce development or uh, attraction, attracting new companies coming into town. Obviously, we hear of Amazon and Shutterfly in, in Shakopee's, for example, but do we have enough synergies in terms of attracting companies into the greater MSP, and specifically Minneapolis-St. Paul? as well as uh, supporting, uh, having enough workforce to support that? Well, uh, first I would say one of the great, um, as other cities around the country look at us, they consider, uh, they consider the civic-minded business community and corporate community we have to be something they wish they had every day. And from that, uh, from you all, and the, and the civic engagement and dedication to making sure our region is successful, uh, has come the Itasca project, and from that grew Greater MSP, our regional development agency, which has been doing really great work. I, you know, we sit on the board, um, uh, as well as many, many folks from the, the business and philanthropic community, um, has done a really great job promoting us as a region, that we are great, uh, there are so many great things about us. Everybody knows we're great here, uh, but other places are left a little, um, a little more in the dark about our awesomeness than we would like them to be. And Greater MSP has taken on the charge, especially in terms of attracting and promoting business here, um, has taken on that charge of making sure the world knows what a great region we are, along with so many of you, along with so many of us and our efforts. Um, and there's been a lot of success. Um, I don't have all the numbers sitting in front of me, but there has been a lot of attraction and promotion to the region. And specifically, I can speak for Minneapolis, a lot of assistance um, uh, working with our, you know, working with our community planning and economic development um, department, ably led by Craig Taylor, who's doing fantastic work there. Um, bringing uh, to Minneapolis, we have, you know, we've had BuzzFeed come, for example, which is really, really exciting. You know, but Arctic Cat has come downtown. We have, um, I'm, I, if I start listing, I'm going to miss, so I will stop there. But, but we have so many great folks coming downtown, uh, coming into the city and investing because they know that's where their employees want to be. Uh, because they know that their employees want to be in the center of that, uh, that vibrancy and have access to that world and that transit. You know, Greater MSP has got a specific effort uh, initiative around uh, the inner cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Cecile Bador, my former planning and economic development director, is, is leading that effort to really look at how do we make sure that we are not just developing in green fields out in the suburban communities, which is not unimportant. We, we acknowledge that, you know, that is a, a huge piece and that's what some companies are looking for. But we also need to be very aggressive about making sure that we get jobs in Frogtown on the greater east side. Uh, on the west side uh, and, and fill in some of those 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 uh, employment holes perhaps uh, if you would call them that uh, so I think that 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 structure working with the local chambers working with uh, the workforce uh, investment boards uh, etc is going to be is going to be critically important but hopefully we're we understand the need I, I think when greater MSP first started you know we were really their, their targeted goals were trying to create jobs that required college education and paid 80,000 plus a year that's fantastic, but not everybody's going to be eligible for those jobs. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the full employment spectrum. And I will just add to that, those also aren't necessarily all the jobs that you need filled. Okay. And so trying to match the workforce needs with the workforce development and the uh, business attraction and promotion has been really important work. As a um, bipartisan member of this community, I wanted um, to make two points. I was gonna say, oh. there's, a, there's a voice. So. I'm hiding, <laughs> and I'm being very successful at that. But Mayor Hodges, I was sad that you did not address the um, brewery inspiration that has occurred in Minneapolis, where there's even a library, I believe, in one of the breweries. So I hope you can expand that, being as I'm more in Washington County than Hennepin at this time. And I also hope that both mayors would not address the issue of 
trees in the metropolis, legacy trees, but um, neonicotinoids and bees and what policies you guys are trying to put forward for that. Thank you. Well, I can't. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. You go address beer and then maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll avoid neonicotinoids, uh, whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, actually, actually, well, here's the deal. Um, I know more about bees than beer. I have to be honest. Uh, what I know about beer is that we have a lot of it and a lot of good beer. Uh, I am not a drinker myself. It turns me into a jerk. But, um, but uh, that doesn't stop me. <laughs> uh, but, but I will say when I. Uh, uh, well played, Mayor Coleman, well played. Um, I will say when, uh, you know, I had the, the, the bet with the mayor of Seattle about the, the Seahawks-Vikings game, the less said the better. Uh, one of the things I bet him was beer from Indeed Brewery because we have, we have been now ranked one of the top beer cities in the country. Uh, and, you know, it's that local beer that people love. Do you want me to say more than that? We're awesome. I, I don't want, uh, I have done a lot to support um, the beer community, but I can't speak knowledgeably of the product. So I have my staff drink a lot just to, <laughs> just to make up for that. But as for bees, um, you know, the, the issue of pollinators in general, but bees in specific, is actually an important one, um, particularly for the, the a lot of the industry we have in Minnesota um, because m most agriculture depends on pollinators of one kind or another. And uh, pollinators are losing their habitat. Monarchs, for example, plant milkweed in your yard uh, and you can have monarchs because that's the only thing uh, that they can use. But um, bees are dying off. Uh, for reasons we don't always know. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. So in Minneapolis at City Hall, we actually, we started with two beehives and then they swarmed and now we have three. And there's some great pictures online of one of our um, regulatory services inspectors um, is also our bee guy in a bee outfit, sort of getting the bees from where they were clinging to the side of inside of City Hall and, and helping them create uh, the new uh, the new hive, and then we have uh, we have good ordinances now in the city for people who actually want to um, uh, what do you call it raise bees you know pet them I guess um, for folks who want to have bees because it's a it's a it's a really important part of agriculture it's a really important part of our ecosystem and if if we lose it it's ground zero um, for a lot of our green so. So uh, we actually have one of the most forward-thinking bee policies in the country that the city council passed um, that um, the, the, the Apiary Society, is that who it was, uh, was very interested to hear that we have. We actually have one of the most supportive um, bee policies in the country. St. Paul also passed, a, you know, mm. previous to a, a year or so ago, you couldn't keep a beehive in the, in the city of St. Paul, and now you can, and it's actually been kind of an interesting program, as you know, uh, with some of the kids over on the east side that are working on those things and, and really uh, understanding that. Um, but I want to go back just on the, on the tree piece. Don't forget the, the Green the Great River Passage. It was one of the really incredible efforts that this community has brought forth. You know, XL was a huge partner in that, uh, to, to plant tens and tens of thousands of trees along the Mississippi River to recreate the flyway uh, through downtown St. Paul. And so uh, I think we're doing some great stuff. Obviously, the, the issue with respect to the, the uh, chemicals and the insecticides that are, that are harming the bees, as we, we assume that that's the, that that's the issue, has got to be addressed on a national level. I mean, we can have bees and we can plant milkweed. And I think, you know, if you came to my front yard, and saw what I don't garden. My mother-in-law gardens for me. Uh, it is, you know, between butterflies and bees. It's, you know, it's like Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom out there. Uh, but uh, you know, we we are making some progress on that front. When you lead a chamber, you get a number of opportunities you never expected. Matt knows this as well. But I was had a chance to serve on the board for the National Bee Association, <laughs> and we worked very hard to bring Apomonia, which is the international festival to Minneapolis-St. Paul in 2019. We went to Seoul, Korea. I did not go. No junket. And we, um, we didn't win the bid. But the fact that the country thought that Minneapolis-St. Paul was where they wanted to have it, the university's been very strong in this area as well. So it's just kind of funny what, you, what gets buzzing once you get things going. <laughs> had to, had to. Hey, hey. I'm going to close with 
thanking, thanking both mayors. When this idea first came up 11 years ago and I mentioned it to RT, he said, I'm game, but you know, Chris is new. And, and I said, let's give Chris the opportunity. And for years, Chris came over to Minneapolis for this breakfast and then said, you know, we should be in St. Paul. And so we have moved it to St. Paul ever since in this great facility. And Chris has stuck with regionalism wonderfully. And Betsy, you have started with regionalism wonderfully. And both of them know, although they're here protecting their cities, how critical it is to have that neighbor who is working so closely with them to make all these things happen. So on behalf of all of us, thank you both for your service and your continued service. Thank, thank you. you very much, Sam. Thank you.